Thank you very much. The last speaker is uh, Professor Roman Freeman. Are the slides fixed? Yeah, okay. It's a pleasure to be here, and I like to, I have very little time and a very big topic. So, I have an agenda, and the agenda is simple, and I will stay there up front and then try to deliver it in the little time that I have. I want to persuade you that by giving up the core axiom that underpins contemporary economics, and I'll define precisely what it is, we can achieve a lot. And I also want to, how do I want to persuade you about this? I can't persuade you about this by telling you that if you keep the axiom, you'll never explain the world. Because of course, as you know, such proof is impossible. So that I can't do. So I want to try another way. I want to try to explain to you that if you keep the axiom, you get into kind, all kinds of problems, which clearly suggest that you will be fixing the model forever. So I think I want to get us out of the socialist reform, which is basically the state we're in right now in economics. And I want us to consider getting rid of the core axiom. So what's the core axiom? The core axiom is the same one that George talked about and that Michael Gorbin and I have devoted quite a bit of time exploring and trying to see what it leads us to. And that axiom is stated on the blackboard. That the economies can fully specify in terms of some causal factors, how individuals alter the way that they make decisions and how market outcomes unfold over time. The simple claim is that that's the axiom that leads us to all kinds of strange behavioral models. It leads us to variety of anomalies empirically and theoretically. So that's, so the pers I can only get the part of the persuasion, the rest you're gonna have to get from the written stuff. So that's, that's the agenda. So I'm going to do a little bit of math. I can't do very much math, obviously. Okay. So just a little bit of math, but I can get with this math very far. So this is a simple model of asset prices. PT is an asset price. Think of it as a stock price. A and B are some parameters. X are some causal factors. And P hat is the expectation that drives asset prices. This is algebra. I will focus only on one aspect. So this is completely standard model. Of course, Michael and I don't do it in a standard way. He will present a model that uses this methodology on, Friday, on Saturday. But think of it as a completely standard model. You go to a macro class. Tom Sargent tells you, you need to do preferences. You need to do expectations. You need to have market clearing, forget sticky prices. That's all some import from MIT. You forget all of it. So that's the model. Market clearing, no sticky prices, preferences, expectations. Okay? And I want to persuade you in that model. First of all, I want to use this little model to persuade you how we got into thinking that what we're doing is relevant. And mo the most important thing that I want to persuade you about is what was the assumption that we made which led us to make all these extravagant claims, both empirical and theoretical, including rational expectations. So I don't want to say rational expectations is wrong. I want to take a different tag. I want, to ex I want to try to deliver the point that once you make one assumption, rational expectations in is inescapable. And any reasonable person, whether a behavioral economist or somebody who believes in, 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 in asymmetric information, they will think rational expectations is what rational agents should do. That to me explains, rather than some bad will, the reason why economists all believe in rational expectations. All of them, from MIT to Chicago, as an expectation of a rational agent. So I want to deliver that point first. Okay? So the key is how do you represent change in a mathematical model? So there are these causal factors. So the left is there's the change in price, the change in axis, and the little thing in parentheses that I focus on, of course, this model is much more general. It's much more open than that. I want to open the model just a little bit. I want to say that there are expectation functions that depend on some causal factor Z. That's all. So just imagine this is a simple algebra. The, the, the thing in square brackets is just the change in expectations functions. 
Now, at the model as it stands, sense absolutely nothing. It's not a theory. It's a model that has fallibility, by the way, and reflexivity. <laughs> and it has no empirical implications. Why? Because whatever you assume about the way beta t and zt change over time and x change over time, whatever you assume, you're going to get a different answer. So if you want to say this model implies that the government should do this, this model will not support it. It doesn't imply any of it. So you have to make a number of assumptions before this model implies something. And what I want to argue is that the only thing conventional economics did for the last 30 years made a fatally extreme assumption that got us into where we are. And actually, I think it's that simple that I can probably do it in 10 minutes. So let me try. OK? So the first thing you need, as Bob Luke has emphasized, I also, what I want to do, I want to bring out the fact that every one of the strands from Ned Phelps, through Bob Lucas, through behavioral economics, they all made a specific contribution. Actually, it will allow me to contrast that contribution with Professor Gingenzer's point as well, because it actually is related to that. So the first thing you have to do, you have to say something about this axis. Don't forget, axis represent government policy. And I'm sure you heard of the idea that governments should follow rules. You may not have the idea that Bob Lucas in 1976 argued that if the governments don't follow rules, we can't say anything about government behavior. So he inverted it. He was like a Hegelian inversion. He says, unless the government follows rules, there, are, there is no scientific policy evaluation. So that part of the paper was forgotten, and we started to assume that following rules is somehow optimal. So the government follows very simple rules. They're just random walks. You adjust money. You can think of it as a simplification of a Friedman money rule or something. Just the next period is the previous period plus some, plus some randomness. You get to six, and we are sort of done. What is six? Six says that the change in price is a function of what the causal variables are today, and some random error term tomorrow that has obviously means zero. <coughs> this is what is called a fully predetermined model, but not what was needed for this. You see, instead of having this complicated business with the betas, I now assume that beta t plus one is equal to beta t. What does that mean? That means that market participants never change the way they think about the future. That's what this means. It's as simple as that. So you make that assumption, and you got something spectacular. You have a probabilistic representation of the market process. You apply standard econometrics. It's fitted for that. You got everything going. It's exactly what you want. And you have what uh, Professor Giggins would say. You've just converted everything to a situation of risk, of course. Because now you have all the outcomes and all the probabilities are known to you as an economist. Now, let me just comment for one second about various ways to depart from it. The most popular way is the heterogeneous agents way and the learning way is to now assume that although the economist knows exactly the world, the agents don't. Now, Bob Lucas once made a point to me that if I assume I know the world, I may assume agents know the world. I want to say I agree with that, OK? But the new fashion to fixing it, that's the socialist reform, is to suppose that the agents don't know everything. They're irrational in this and that way. But the economist knows exactly how irrational they are. I have news for you. The economist here also knows how imperfect his own knowledge is. Because as you know from basic econometrics, the economist's know, imperfect knowledge is, of course, in the error term. When you come and teach econometrics, you say, we know everything, what we don't know is in the error term. But the interesting thing about the error terms in macro models is that the economists assume that they have a constant probability distribution over time, and therefore the economist predetermines not just agents' imperfect knowledge, but his own imperfect knowledge. Now, let me tell you what that leads to. I only focus on rational expectations. That's the, there's one misconception in the literature this has to do with the efficient market hypothesis. People think efficient market hypothesis is about optimal use of information. That's far insufficient. Fama understood this. Samuels understood this. You do need rational expectations. Otherwise, you don't get, what do you mean use of information? You have to say how the information gets transmitted into outcomes. So the EMH is a direct implication of this. If you don't want the EMH, you have to do what Joe did. You have to assume that information is asymmetric, and that gets you out of the EMH under REH. But 
So, so basically, there are models that pre-specify change and all that stuff. They all amount to the same thing mathematically. It's my book with Michael 2007 does that. Okay? So, so now I want to give you the REH narrative. You see, I don't want to say REH is the wrong theory. I want to say, why is it that the, on completely logical, rational grounds that economists concluded that REH was the right theory? So now, what did we assume? We assume that there is no non-routine change, right? The way people change their mind, I can pre-specify. The way the world works, I can pre-specify. All the, the economic theory in an economic model is all embedded in the parameters and in the causal variables. Once I assume I can write them down, I assume that there's no, nothing unexpected ever happens. And if it's in the error term, then the probability, uh, I can assign probabilities to it. Once you assume that, you have no option. You have to go to REH. Because if I write down the model that tells me how the world works exactly, how could, it, in my right mind, I assume that people who seek to make money don't forecast according to that model? Now, I must be assuming that. That was Bob's argument. And then he said, if you don't assume this, you assume that there's systematic forecast errors. It's only in the paper, but we don't need to go into it. And how can you assume that somebody leaves money on the pavement time after time? So you go to REH. Now behavioral economists arrive, then we waste decades, and then they be, we don't study how people form expectations because we already know it, right? Our model tells us how people form expectations. Great quote from, from, uh, from Tom Sargent. Okay, so let me just make this point in a second. The normal argument is that the smart people are the ones who forecast rationally, and all this, this in this sense, I completely agree with Professor King, is that, and these feeble minds just can't get the world. And they unfortunately have to follow trends, and they have to do this, and they have to do that. Michael and I suggest that smart people will never do the REH. They would never follow the rules based on a fixed model. They would just never do that. REH is an utterly, obviously irrational strategy in the real world markets. So then, lo and behold, behavior economists arise, and what do they do? They go finally and look how people behave in the real world, right? And what do they find? That no one behaves like this. So now, what would you think you would conclude from that? Or you would think if nobody behaves like this, maybe this rationality business, and assuming away no routine change is wrong. No, they don't conclude that. They conclude that the people they saw are irrational. And, and then we go to neuroeconomics and we study, this was, I, I exactly agree with this, and we study why is it that they're rational, because we have to establish alternative foundations. So the alternative foundation is to figure out through scans how people actually, why is it that they leave this money on the pavement? There must be something wrong with them. Or that something wrong must be because they're emotional, they have a br some brain impairment, this and that and the other. Now, how do we rebuild this thing? So, now, let me just make one more point for a minute that this derailed the entire research program. When Phelps put forth the micro foundations, the idea was that expectations were supposed to be one of the driving forces in markets. It was an obvious observation that everyone knows who's ever been in markets or thought about that, or read the newspaper. <clears throat> Russia expectations arrived and said, no, no, wait a second, we don't need expectations as being factors in markets. We're gonna tell you how people think. Here's Dom Sargent. On the contrary, economist models has already told us how people think. That's Tom Sargent. In Russia expectations models, people believes are among the outcomes of our, our theorems. They're not inputs. So now, of course, that was completely misinterpreted that somehow that means that people don't, uh, uh, don't commit mistakes. But <laughs> I mean, I can't. So that's one implication of this. Now, but there was something about the REH that was very positive that it's not in the, in the heuristics models, although this is all an extremely valuable empirical research. Muth pointed out that the way people interpret the world matters for the way outcomes work. That was right. What went wrong is that then he and Bob Lucas particularly assumed that the economists will know how people exactly think, what model they use. That, of course, is not how the world works. So, and that, so then when you go to markets, of course, you find all these discrepancies. But that insight is valuable, and that's the insight we learned. 
What about the behavioral insight? Of course it's valuable. Of course people have to use psychology and heuristics and all these things because they can't compute to the end. That has been known since Keynes. He has a whole discussion about how you can't compute to the end when you're rational. It's in the general theory. So now the key question for the future, which I can't answer because I want to close on time, I promise. What do we do with all this? So how do we take all of those insights and have a theory that we can take to the data? Well, that's what IKE attempts to do. And the key to IKE is that it takes out only one assumption, that either the, economy, that the economies can, that the quest for finding the exact model of the market is going to turn out to be successful. As I said, I can't prove it will not be successful, but IKE basically explicitly starts by saying, and what we learned so far is that while we cannot know so much, by abandoning the quest for it, we find out many things. We find out how fundamentals matter for outcomes when Ken Rogoff found out that they don't matter. We find out how psychology matters without assuming that people leave money on the pavement. And on and on. Now, I want to be modest about this. We know in financial markets that I think works. I will work with Katarina, Giuseppe, and Sarah, and they will be further moved in the center. Shows us that by combination with the judicious, yeah, I finished, with the judicious empirical methods that are actually rich and don't impose phenomenal structure, you can actually find out something. And what Katarina found that these things are broadly consistent with the IKE reasoning. I want to close with Tony, and he'll give me an extra minute on this. Tony had argued that there are no regularities on the basis of which you can do mathematical models. That's a pessimistic view. We suggest that in financial markets, we have found them. Now, is this a claim that we'll find them everywhere? No, because as Professor Cartwright said, of course, knowledge is local. So in some situations, you might find it. In some situations, you might not find it. If you can find it, we have an apparatus which is not the standard probabilistic apparatus, but it is a probabilistic apparatus, just doesn't imply one probability distribution for the world, that will allow us to model this. If we cannot find it, then we're going to have to accept that certain things will remain a sphere of narrative analysis. I want to make one final point, that even when we do mathematics, once you open the model and eliminate the a prioristic idea that we know exactly how everybody thinks, we need humanities, we need history, we need psychology, we need all of those things. And this is a, I want to, so there's a lot of complaint about that it's not multidisciplinary, multi the field. My claim is that until the field adopts the, until the field dispenses with the axiom of, of perfect knowledge and adopts the idea of fallibility, we will not have multidisciplinary studies because economists will not look at other things unless they have to look at them. And we need to open these models, and then the economists will start looking at them, and that would open up the field. So that's. Thank you.